If you can increase retention through communication by getting people to understand the values of the organization, adopt the culture of the organization, embrace safe behaviors, healthy behaviors, all sorts of things, you can have an immense impact on the ROI of your company. I'm Ari Marin, and you're listening to Season 6 of In Good Companies from Cadence Bank, the podcast where we talk about the future of business to help you get where you want to go. Whether you're a budding entrepreneur or a seasoned leader, we're with you. Our priority is your success. Hey, folks. How do you keep track of what's happening in your company day after day? Do you have a newsletter? Are you on the right messaging channels? Or is it more of a herd it down the grapevine situation? How does information reach you? I'm asking because research by Gallup found that nearly three quarters of employees feel they're missing out on work news. That's a lot of people. So in this episode, we're diving into the world of internal communications. We're going to hatch some plans, discuss how to share our values and our goals at the company level, and we find out why effective communication can help us face the unexpected. Because as today's guest would tell you, that's the future of work. Communication is becoming more important than it ever has. And certainly was introduced in organizations. So I think that we have to diffuse the negative consequences that come with that. You know, there's different levers that are, that are in there that are causing the, the uncertainty. We've got to identify what those are and what a company's response wants to be. And then we have to find ways to do what we always do. Engage employees, get them to internalize the messaging, and then adopt the behaviors that we want them to adopt. That voice you just heard, it belongs to John Perenic. And if you need somebody for everything communication, he's your guy. John is the president and CEO of Partnercom, an internal comms consulting firm he's been running with his wife for nearly 30 years. Before he got into business, he used to teach organizational communication. He got a PhD for it, and it shows. Because John, he loves a good story. Ask him how it all started at Partnercom. You'll see. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting out there story. So I was at this large firm and my wife worked at the same firm, which is ideally, and we were in a little bit different areas. There's a lot of stories between my wife and I, but that's for a different podcast. We're invited to dinner by a person that I worked with and he said, I want to start our own company and you guys would be great because you have slightly different expertise areas than what we have. There was a couple other people. And he was a really good salesman, and he sold us. We thought we could do the same things we were doing at, at this other firm better, uh, more efficiently, cheaper to clients. And so we left, started our own company, and I think there were five of us when we started. And, and here we are 30 years later with a little over 100 people and you know 10% of the Fortune 500 companies as clients. So it's worked out pretty well. That's right. The Karenics got poached. That's how they started their firm. Now, the company has turned into a family business. It's been three decades. They bought out their old partner and their children are on board. So the potential they saw in Partnercom, that leap of faith, it really paid off. And by the look of things, it's going to continue that way because communication, it's gaining momentum inside our companies. When we started the company, I actually had a person tell me, our turnover is 400%. I don't care about communication to employees. That's the exact company that should have been concerned about it because if you could have lowered it from 400 to 300%, they would have saved enormous amounts of money. Today, what we have is companies almost universally understanding at some level that communication is important to employees. So what's changed? And why is communication such a good lever for business? We're going to get to that. But first, we need to understand what internal communications is all about. We are focused primarily on telling a company's stories to its employees. From a practical strategic standpoint, we are trying to get employees to understand the values of a company, what behaviors the company wants them to do, to appreciate the benefits that they get, and, and a variety of things like that. Usually, we get called in when there's somewhat of a problem. It doesn't have to be a problem, but there's an objective. We want employees to accept this change. Uh, we want people to adopt healthier behaviors. We want people to actually embrace the training programs that we have. We want them to work safely. There's issues like that. We see healthiness and medical costs related programs being a huge part of what we're asked to get involved in. And this has been a problem since I've been in the business. So it's you know at least 30 plus years is that healthcare costs for companies are an enormous part of their expense. Most large companies that we deal with 
if one of their employees has a heart transplant, they're paying for the heart transplant. And so if they can get people to have fewer heart transplants, then that's a big deal. A few years ago, we had a company who was having an extremely high cost of premature births. And we did focus groups. We talked to the people who had had babies and those kinds of things. And we found out that women didn't know all the things that they needed to do and be aware of when they were pregnant. And number two, they were afraid of their managers maybe firing them if they went to a natal care appointment with their OBGYN while they're at work. Uh, and so we had the company put in some incentives for the general manager communication as well as employee communication. And they lowered their costs by something like 20% the first year after these programs were put into place. And so those are the kinds of things that, number one, we see. We work with change communication. We work with benefits communication. We work with human resources. We work with culture. The list goes on for a while. Recruiting communication. But you see what John is saying, right? Internal communications means getting everyone aligned around the same values, retaining talent, making better financial decisions. It means overcoming obstacles together and looking after everyone, from the boardroom to reception. And yes, that can be done through storytelling, which, you know, John is very good at. I'm just going to give you one kind of brief example. Retention. There's some research out there that shows that for every person that you have to replace, so a person leaves the company, you have to replace that person, between direct and indirect costs could end up being as much as two to four times that person's salary. So if you have a person you're paying $100,000 to, the cost of replacing that person could be two to 400000 maybe even more if it's a senior level person. So you have an HR person has to post a job. You have the, that cost. You have to interview them. Multiple people, you have to onboard them. Those are direct costs. But then you have other things like loss of expertise. That person that, that comes in has to get up to speed, and that takes time, which means you might lose efficiency, quality, sales, depending on what that person's in, during that time period. It might have an impact on team morale. So there's a lot of indirect costs too. So that's just a, one person. So if you can increase retention through communication by getting people to understand the values of the organization, adopt the culture of the organization, embrace safe behaviors, healthy behaviors, all sorts of things, you can have an immense impact on the ROI of your company. You see, communication holds potential for business. I mean, when we know what our teams need, when we hear what leaders can or can't do, we're in a better spot to work together. The goal becomes quality inside and out. So the question is not, should we do it? Rather, how do we get started? I can imagine that communication strategies vary from business to business. But are there some foundational principles we should all know about? Yeah, so we have this little model that we use as a starting point. You know, you have to first find out what the objectives are. What's going on in a company? We clarify what the objectives are that we're being asked to address. And then we have this little model that we call no think, feel, do. It's pretty simple, but it's pretty powerful at the same time. So number one is, is no. You've got to get people to be aware of whatever it is that's out there. If it's safety, let's just take safety, for example. If you want people to adopt safe behaviors, you've got to make them aware that safety is a problem, it can impact them, where to go to find information, et cetera. Think is understand it. So they're aware of it now, but so what? Is there an understanding? Is there an acceptance of the information and the issues that you're, you're talking about? So that's number two. Then feel. There's an attitude, there's a value, depending on what the objective is, that you've got to get people to internalize. So one of the big issues in companies is pay, for example. Companies will tell us person A makes more here than they could if the, in, in a general in the marketplace. Yet we go talk to employees or they do survey research and they find out that employees don't value or believe that that's the case with their pay. They think they're below market. So we've got to do something to educate people about that. But it's not just educate. It's actually get them to value and accept the fact that they're paid above market. That's not an easy one in the context of what we're talking about, but... You know, it is important. And then finally, there's, in some cases, you want people to do something. You want them to adopt healthier behaviors. You want them to take a training class so they can en enhance their career. You, you want them to sell more. You want them to, to follow the rules that you put in for quality, whatever those happen to be. 
So strategy number one, no think, feel, do. Get the information, digest it. Really see how that applies to you. And then act on it. To me, that's another way of saying, when you really engage with a topic, you come at it from all angles. Because everyone has different ways to learn. Not everybody understands in the same way. So some people like to read, some people like to watch videos, some people watch TikTok. It's just different things. And, you know, that's somewhat generational. Most companies have a pretty good dispersion these days of older employees, middle group employees, younger employees. We've got to communicate to all of them. And we don't want to make the mistake that there are no 20-somethings who might be more traditional in their approach to learning than another 20-something. So we really have to say we want to use a variety of messaging and a variety of channels of communication in order to reach people most effectively. What we like to call surround sound. That means that you don't just use one channel. And that cuts across whether we're talking formal channels like video, microsites, home mailers, to non-traditional things like experiential communication, use of social media in very specific instances. That's really how to engage people in a different way. The hard part is cutting through the noise. I mean, I don't know where you're listening from right now, if you're at work or in the car, but just look around you. People, sounds, ads, screens. There's so much information in our environment. It's hard to know what really needs our attention. I was doing a focus groups for a client one time. This is about five or six years ago. I had a, a copy of a mailer that had gone, and on the envelope it said important benefit information inside, and it had gone to all employees. And I asked the group, these were all 20-somethings, we had split the groups by demographics, and I held up, I said, how many of you received this piece? And there were 10 people in the group, and only two of them said they received it. So eight of them, we didn't get the awareness, even the awareness, because it, they, they all got it. One of the people who did not get it said, I might have gotten it, but I throw all that stuff away. And I said, it says important benefit information. Yeah, if it's really important, they'll get it to me some other way. So I mean, she says, I, I never opened any. I said, what if it was a check? I actually asked that question. And she goes, well, I'll get it eventually. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. That's the extreme, I'll have to admit. But that's the attitude, general attitude we're dealing with. You know, whatever it is that, that people are trying to compete for their time with, employees have lots of competing messages. We've got to break through that clutter and say, hey, this is coming from your company, but this is important. And we've got to find a way to engage those employees, cut through the clutter, and creativity is what's going to do it. So one question, selfish question of mine is, what inspires you to be creative? How do people get there? Is it the personal <laughs> experiences? How does somebody become creative? I believe, and I'm not one of the creative genius. I'd say I'm in the medium level in our company. I'm not at the top and I'm not at the bottom. I would just tell you that there are some people who are more creative than others. We have some really creative people and we, we try to hire for that. You know, that's something that you look for when you hire people and then you can develop those people. That's why not everybody is right for an advertising agency. I mean, I, I look at billboards. I see some that I'm just like, wow, that is really, really creative. That was great. That message really hit me. It's just maybe a couple of words, but you go, wow, that was really good. So I do think creativity is somewhat personality-based. Once you have that, you can't sit on it. You've got to work at developing it. You've got to pay attention. My wife is one of our creative geniuses. We were in a museum in Europe. And she stopped at something and said, take a picture of that. And I said, okay. I said, you really like that? She goes, oh, yeah, it's okay. She goes, but I've got this idea for this client, and I think this would really work this way. And she described how it was going to work, and it had nothing to do with the picture. It was the inspiration she got about how she was going to apply it. So I think those kind of people are kind of turned on all the time. You know, they look at Instagram, they look at Pinterest, they look at billboards, they look at television ads, they look at social media, they look at art, they look at nature. And they're always trying to say, what can I learn from what I'm seeing other people do that I can adapt and, and use myself? So it's a constant learning experience. And I, I actually think that's one of the things that all companies can profit from. I agree. Creativity is something that we all have in us. Some people are creative with numbers, with systems, others with visuals, words. We've got different talents. We just have to explore them. When we use everyone's imagination, we can communicate effectively. I get a chance to visit a lot of different companies and sometimes you walk into a conference room and there on the wall is kind of a framed plaque 
of the seven values that the company has. And I've held focus groups and asked the people what the company's values were, and, and nobody knows. And then I said, well, they're right there on the wall. And they go, oh, yeah, I, I've seen that. I really didn't know what it was because it's small and it's just not brought to anybody's attention. So, you know, we did something non-traditional. So we created a program called Six Word Stories. And we asked people in the organization, employees, to create stories about the company's culture that were limited to exactly six words, no more, no less. And we collected those on a microsite that we created for that. So people would submit their stories. We then put them up and people could go there and read the stories and vote on what they thought best represented the company's values. Then we took what the people said and we created artwork and we put the artwork up on walls. So it was experiential. They saw it as as one six word story or on elevators, you can do that. You could create posters, but wall art is what we created. And I remember, I don't remember many of them, but this is my favorite, was uh, bagels for breakfast, competitors for lunch. It's a great thing about being competitive. And that's what one of the values was to be competitive. And when you see it, you know, a six foot by six foot drawing with bagels on it and some big mouth eating a competitor, you see that on a regular basis. You may not remember the exact term of the value, but you get the impression of it. And so that kind of outside the box, breaking kind of the norms, looking at something in a different way, engages all employees who want to be engaged, who want to be interactive, who want to have outside the normative thinking, non-traditional thinking to, uh, to communication. I love this example because the best way to engage with your team, it's probably to speak their language, right? Communication is something that we can personalize, make it our own, which is why I'm curious to hear how John practices what he preaches. So you work with clients every day, but you also have a business you're growing. Any examples of how you use internal communications to enhance your own process and your culture? Whoa, boy, that one, I didn't see that one coming, Ari. I, I, <laughs> you know, we're smaller than our, most of our clients have, you know, 20, 30, 100,000 employees. So it's the, the organizational barriers are very different in those companies than they are in ours. So we have a, a monthly company call, for example, that all employees attend. I mean, so you can't do that when you have 100,000 employees. We can do that. And then one of the things I learned a long time ago that I, that I tried to do, I, I heard a story one time, and I'll, I'll tell it shortly because I think it's so impactful, is that the head of research for a very large, world-renowned tech company, turned in his resignation to the CEO. And the CEO reportedly said, you've got to stay. You can't leave. You've, you've been here forever and you're so important to us. And he goes, no, I've already given my word to this other company. I'm leaving. But why? Why are you leaving? I thought you loved to hear. Well, I like the work a lot. He goes, but I don't have a window in my office. And he goes, well, we, we, you're in the lab and it's kind of in this you know, area and da, 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 da. And he goes, yeah, but I really wanted a window in my office. He goes, I'll, I'll blast a window in your office. We can put a window in your office. He goes, no, I gave my word. And, and so the, the story goes, the guy left because he didn't have a window in his office. That was the fundamental reason. And so this person put in a program at his company that required all managers twice a year to sit down with their employees, not give performance feedback, to ask them a simple question. What is there on their job that's making you unhappy? What would you specifically, would you change that would make it better for you here? That CEO, by the way, it was Bill Gates. The year was 2000. Microsoft lost one of its prized chief executives, Kai Fu Lee, the founding director of research for Microsoft China. And wait, it gets worse. When Lee shuts the door, he goes to Google, the number one competitor, becomes president of Google China for a number of years. So you see a window, it's no small thing, even for the big guys. Fighting for talent is really important. So whether it's everything from recruiting to employee value proposition work, we're trying to figure out what can we offer employees for their 40 hours here. Obviously pays a part of that, benefits are a part of that, but there's a culture. There are specific programs. There's a community involvement. There's opportunities to grow your career that are offered to employees. And we've got to figure out a way for them to understand those and engage in those programs and be more committed to the company as a result of that. We need people to stay and we need more new people to come. We've got to get these things under control. And to do that, one word of advice, bottoms up. 
I meet with all my employees at least once a year, sometimes twice. And at least one of those times, I give them the opportunity to tell me, what is it about your job that you don't like that you would specifically change if you had the choice? Now, I can't do all the things they say. I mean, I'll be quite honest. But I want to hear those things. So if I hear something that I can change, I can do that and keep that person here. We try to create an environment that allows bottom-up communication. There's a pretty active grapevine here. I call it a channeled grapevine, but it, it's just people's thoughts and desires and those things don't have to wait for a once a year thing, that they go to the right people and get them to me and we can decide what to do about those things. I think that's a really important option for companies to make our culture better and our jobs better. I feel like this relates to big changes in our cultural environment. We expect different things from our workplaces these days. In your view, what new cultural communications come with these changes? The first thing that comes to mind is the, you know, the impact of the pandemic. That had immediate cultural and communication implications. So one of the things that happened to us is we had to communicate what the policies were, what the responsibilities were for employees who are now working from home because that was safe. But the other thing that happened immediately was it created a two-tier system for employees of certain companies. So, for example, an airline. That's right. Those of us working corporate and, quote-unquote, non-essential jobs could stay at home. But if you worked in the service industry, healthcare, transportation, suddenly you had a very different reality. This two-tier system caused a little bit of cultural tension, and companies have struggled with that. My guess is it had to do with productivity. Productivity is a big concern in business at the moment, and it's legitimate. We're still experimenting with remote work. We don't have years of insights, and what's hard is employees and leaders are not always on the same page. This is where communication becomes tricky. It's all fun and games until you can't see eye to eye. I know employees, one of the things they will say is I'm, I'm more efficient at home. I don't have to commute. I don't have distractions. I can just sit and do my work. But there are a number of other factors involved in that. There's a lot less accountability. You don't have a manager who can actually see what you're doing, talk to you, all those kinds of things when you work from home. And so you might be doing the wrong thing. You might be very efficient, but not doing the work that your manager wants you to do or the way it's being done. Number two is you lose some of that, that interaction, that team environment, learning from each other and playing off each other that's, that's actually really important. And so you lose some of that and, and maybe lose some innovation as a result. So individuals think they're more efficient. Companies are saying we're not as productive as we used to be. So we need to do something different. And so what we have in today's environment is I was talking to a person who works for a bank. It's not one of our clients, but works for a bank. And they got an email at 5 o'clock on Friday saying starting the Tuesday after Labor Day, everyone is expected to be back in the office full time. So for four and a half years, they've been working from home. They had a somewhat flexible schedule, some days in, some days out. Now they're going to have to be back in. Why did they do that? Well, I, didn't, I don't know specifically in this case, but I certainly would not have advised them to send an email at five o'clock on Friday and just an email. There, the, you know, there needed to be some prep for it. There needed to be a variety of, I would have had manager communication involved. There was none of that. You're creating a culture now of people who are resentful of having to be back at work. And I think that's the biggest cultural implication is trying to deal with that work at home, work at work, flexible. What's the, is there a happy medium? And, and I did to be, to, you know, quite honest, I don't know where we're going to end up, but I know that no matter where you end up, there's a need for communication. And we've got to find out what is it that the company wants to do? What are the messages and objectives that it needs to have communicated? And then find the best ways to do that. So that's a big deal. For entrepreneurs and businesses who might be looking for a good communication practice that can weather future challenges, what can they learn from change management? I think change management, number one, starts with transparency. We deal with a lot of companies who ultimately want to spin something that they perceive as negative to their employees, a positive spin. I'll give you an example. We had a company who, who had to offshore a large percentage of jobs over an 18 to 24 month period. And, and one of the things was it's important for the financial health of the company to do this. That's true. But employees don't really care about that, right? If I don't have a job, I could care less about the financial health of your company if, I, if my job's going away. Being transparent with people, not necessarily about the reason for it, but how it's going to impact you and what we're going to do for you as a company to help you in this process. So, you know, that may be constructing resumes, job searching, maybe interviewing skills, et cetera. So when you did lay someone off, they've got the tools they need to find another job. 
You're not going to find a job for them, but you can equip them to be able to better find a job. And then you let everybody know that, not just the employees who are getting laid off, but the ones staying behind. And the ones who stay behind are as important to the culture as the ones leaving. And so you want them to know you're treating those people correctly. The communication traditionally has not been for people who are leaving a company. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time and effort communicating to people who are leaving the company. But, you know, that's all in the realm of transparency, is being as as honest as you can with people about the things that impact them. I think any entrepreneur needs to remember that as well. Transparency and reliability. That's John's recipe for success. When we trust that our company will tell us exactly what's going on, when we can discuss things together, when we know that our teams are engaged, we're prepared for whatever comes our way. So in the spirit of good communication, let's recap the details. One more time. Internal communications cover many areas of business, from performance goals to benefits entitlement. When done right, they affirm your company values, help you retain talent, and save money down the line. Point is, when everyone knows what's going on inside of your business, you gain long-term security. And that's great, because the future is unpredictable. So don't forget, know, think, feel, do. Get the information, digest it, understand it, act on it. It will take time to communicate with your team effectively. So make sure you provide several access points to information. A mailer, a poster, a workshop. When it comes to communication, be creative and rely on teamwork to get different perspectives. Want to launch a new performance campaign? Get people involved, organize brainstorms. And to improve your employee retention, collect feedback. At the end of the day, This is cultural work. Your communication will help you manage big change. So be strategic, prioritize well-being, stay transparent, and your people will trust that you're taking them places. I want to thank John Karenik for sharing his insights and his many business tales. It was a delight and a privilege to speak with him today. This was In Good Companies from Cadence Bank. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, why don't you follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen? And when business is hot, you'll be the first to know. You can always leave a review or a five-star rating or share this podcast around. The more, the merrier. In Good Companies is a podcast from Cadence Bank, member FDIC, equal opportunity lender. Our production team is Natalie Barron and Edie Pangeli. Our executive producer is Daniel Purnell. This podcast is made in collaboration with the team at Lower Street. Writing and production from Lise Lavadi. Sound design and mixing by Ben Cranel. This podcast is provided as a free service to you and is for general informational purposes only. Cadence Bank and its affiliates make no representation or warranties as to the accuracy, completeness, or timeliness of the content in the podcast. The podcast is not intended to provide legal, accounting, or tax advice and should not be relied upon for such purposes. To the extent that this podcast includes predictions about the economy, these predictions are subject to a number of variables and you should confer with your legal, accounting, and tax advisors for their input regarding the possible outcomes of any economic subject matter discussed herein. Predictions are forward-looking statements that reflect current views with respect to, among other things, future events. Forward-looking statements are not historical facts and are based on current expectations, estimates, and projections, many of which, by their nature, are inherently uncertain and beyond the control of any person or entity. Accordingly, please be aware that any such forward-looking statements are not guarantees and are subject to risks, assumptions, and uncertainties that are difficult to predict. The views and opinions expressed by the host and guests in this podcast are solely their own current opinions regarding the subject matter discussed in the podcast and are based on their own opinions. Such views, perspectives, and opinions do not reflect those of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates or the companies with which any guest is or may be affiliated. The production and presentation of this podcast by Cadence Bank does not imply the expressions of any opinion on the part of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates.